Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Legacy of the Civil War, an online professional development seminar sponsored by the Florida Virtual School and the National Humanities Center. I'm Richard Schramm, the Vice President for Education Programs here at the Humanities Center, and I will be moderating this morning's session. I see a lot of old uh, friends on our participant list, and I see some new folks up there, too, and we're delighted to have them with us. Let me just take a, few, uh, a second or two here to introduce the National Humanities Center to our new seminar participants. The, seminar, the center, rather, is located in Research Triangle Park, North Carolina. It is the country's only independent institute for advanced study in all branches of the humanities. That's a real mouthful. Uh, what that simply means is that we run a fellowship program that brings scholars from this country and abroad to the center to research and write books and articles on subjects in history, literature and language studies, philosophy, criticism of the arts, that sort of thing. We've been doing a lot of things uh, for teachers. The center is distinctive in that it runs a vigorous outreach program for uh, pre-collegiate teachers. If you want to find out what we offer teachers, please go to our website. You can just type National Humanities Center into any browser, and on the left-hand side of the uh, index there, you'll see a whole bunch of things that we offer for teachers. But let me point out one thing that we do. Uh, we offer seminars just like this one throughout the academic year to teachers uh, from all over the country. Uh, this is our 2011-12 schedule. Uh, we cover most of the fall right now, but we'll be adding new seminars within the next few weeks. So please check those out. The seminars are just like these. There is a slight registration fee, but uh, you get the access to uh, the, the wisdom of some really excellent scholars, and I think you'll, you'll enjoy them. We've got a good uh, seminar schedule coming up for 2012, and I urge you to take a look at, at it. Uh, before we get underway, let me point out that uh, the website <clears throat> that you used for this seminar, Legacy of the Civil War website, you can go to that to find a recording of this presentation and the PowerPoint. And as always, let me urge you to plunder the PowerPoint. Uh, we want you to use the material in your classes, and so the PowerPoint is there for your instructional use. Uh, you will also find the evaluation on uh, the, this website. Please click into it, uh, fill it out. You can submit it online, as always. Uh, let me remind you, it is very important to us. We pay attention to what you say. We try to improve the seminars based on your comments, and it is also important to your Teaching American History project. Now, I also will tell you again that we provide a documentation of participation. After we receive, receive your seminar evaluation, we will mail you a letter that you can submit to your local certifying authority to obtain whatever certification credit your participation in this seminar warrants. Are there any questions before we get underway? If we're ready to go, if everybody's ready to go, send me a, a smiley face there. You see that smiley face icon on your, on your screen? That way I know you're, you're out there and you're listening and you're ready to go. Great. <laughs> okay. Those those crack me up. I, I enjoy seeing that. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we have two simple goals this morning. Uh, we are going to explore the legacy of the Civil War to help deepen your understanding of Civil War, how the Civil War was remembered in the 19th century and how that memory comes down to us today. And we also hope to provide you with some fresh material and ideas to bring into your classrooms to strengthen your teaching. Now, we had a robust discussion of the uh, a topic on our uh, forum, and you see the questions there. Uh, the first one I'd like to just take a few, a few seconds to, to talk about a bit. What was everyday life like immediately following the Civil War? We're probably not going to talk about that much in this seminar, but I do want to point out some resources. Right after the war, I mean immediately after the war, Northern publications sent swarms of reporters down into the South to report on everyday life. Uh, immediately following the war. There are a number of books. best one that I have run across is uh, John Richard Dennett's The South As It Is, 1865-66. Dennett was a reporter for The Nation magazine. He was in the South in June of 1865, just a few weeks really after uh, the uh, surrender at Appomattox. Uh, that's out of print, maybe kind of hard to find, but it is really uh, a worthwhile read and will give you a very good picture of what everyday life was like immediately after the Civil War. Now, I know I haven't introduced our speaker yet, our, our seminar leader, but uh, David, let me uh, pass the microphone to you, and uh, I'll ask you to come in, and uh, if you've got any other comments you could make about that journalism uh, immediately after the war, we'd certainly like to hear it. Uh, well, thank you, Richard. Uh, great to be here. Great to have this chance to uh, communicate with teachers all over Florida or, or anywhere. Uh, I, uh, I too, was a high school teacher the first seven years of my career. So uh, 
I have some idea what you what you good folks do every day. On the uh, com on the question of the journalist traveling in the South, yeah, there's a whole small genre of these books, and they're they're amazing firsthand accounts. Uh, another one that I really like is by John Trowbridge, T R O W B R I D G E. I think it's called The South. It's battlefields and cities or something like that. Trowbridge was actually a poet uh, and a writer. Um, he was hired uh, by New York newspapers to travel all over the South, and his is very rich in descriptions of battlefields, cemeteries. He did endless interviews with people all over the South. There's a whole genre of these that are published uh, in the late 1860s, and they're, they're great kind of eyewitness accounts to the destruction, the ruins, um, but also the attitudes. What they really went after were the attitudes of the South at this, you know, at this moment of collapse and chaos and destruction. And in some ways, they were efforts by the Northern press to uh, lay down a kind of a framework, even for what might happen with Reconstruction. Okay, good. Well, there are some there are some resources. Uh, you see uh, Dennett's book up there, and then in the chat, I put the the title of Trowbridge's uh, "The South: A Tour of Its Battlefields and Ruined Cities." Yeah. In addition to that question, there were several other questions about uh, African Americans in the aftermath of the war. How well were freed African Americans welcomed into the North? How were the newly freed blacks accepted in the cities of the South, especially the highly skilled who actually earned money as slaves? Were these skilled workers a base for African American leadership? How did the massive and then then we move just to another topic how did the massive number of deaths caused by the war affect american society and that there's a lot of scholarship going on around that topic right now in the post-war period did women especially widows see an increase in their economic legal or political power what did and does the Shaw Memorial mean and teaching resources? Move in uh, further here, let me just introduce our uh, seminar leader today. David W. Blight is the class of 1954 professor of American history and the director of the Gilder Lehrman Center for the Study of Slavery, Resistance, and Abolition at Yale. You see his publications there. I highly recommend Race and Reunion. You see the number of prizes that one. Uh, and I'm also looking forward uh, to his new book coming out in just a few weeks. American Oracle, the Civil War in the Civil Rights Era. So let me pass the baton to David so he can run the uh, PowerPoint. David, it's all yours. Uh, okay, uh, just to be clear, do do I hit the arrows to advance this or you, you do it? Yes, you do, you do. Oh, I do. That arrow okay. to the right of the zero oh, nine right, box. Right, right, right. There okay, here we are, here we are, here we are. Okay, everybody. Well, I had you read the first 10 pages of Robert Penn Warren's wonderful little classic, The Legacy of the Civil War. Uh, they only allow the first 10 pages to be photocopied and sent out or, or used uh, for copyright reasons. But th this little book, if you don't know it, uh, is, is a, uh, it's a meditation, really. It's about 100 pages. Warren, the great southern poet novelist, in 1960 and 61 was challenged by the editors at Life magazine to write a, a take on where he thought. Civil War memory was at the 100th anniversary, at the centennial, and this this pamphlet was really first published in Life magazine as a long essay. It's chock full of observations about the place of the Civil War in American history, the place of this event in the national memory, uh, the place of it in the sort of surviving culture of the society at its 100th anniversary. And he says, among many other things, um, <laughs> it's a pretty bold statement, is the Civil War the great single event of our history? It may, in fact, be said to be American history. Later, he says things like, the United States really had no history until the Civil War. Um, uh, he says it's America's felt history. Um, and then, you know, he, he takes up the question of causation, among many others. And he says, uh, as the white southerner who at that point, of course, had moved to the north and was actually living right here in New Haven, Connecticut, he says, slavery looms up mountainously in the story and cannot be talked away. That represents probably for Warren um, a realization in his own lifetime. I mean, he was born in 1905 that um, slavery had been talked away 
It had been evaded. Uh, it had been avoided uh, uh, mountainously, <laughs> to use his word, all over the culture. Later in the book, and not in the ten pages you read, there's that last passage. The Civil War draws us as an oracle, darkly unriddled and pretentious of personal as well as national faith. So I guess I would just put the question, is the Civil War this big of a turning point, this big of a marker, this big of a pivot, if you want, in our national experience, in our national memory? Is it some kind of American oracle, if we understand that word in the Greek sense, that is a place, an event, a set of ideas, uh, cluster of memories that we somehow return to, go to, over and over and over to understand ourselves. Is the Civil War our oracle? And if so, how so? Uh, what does he mean? Where would that oracle be? If it is an oracle, where do you go to find it? Little, little Round Top or High Water Market Gettysburg, Monument Avenue in Richmond, the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, the Shaw Memorial in Boston, and on and on. We have Stone Mountain in Georgia. I mean, where is this oracle? And we're going to be constantly uh, butting up against this kind of question, of course, uh, this year and in the coming three to four years as we continue to experience this uh, national sesquicentennial of this event. So. Warren has a way of asking the big questions here. What, just where does the Civil War fit in our national culture? Okay, let's, <clears throat> let's see. We have two responses already. Patrick Jones says, I think it challenged the very fiber of democracy. And Angela Chapin writes, um, yes, because if you delete it from our history, this country is a completely different place. Uh -huh. um, Patrick goes on, I think he was looking for the total uh, totality of the meaning of the war. Laura writes, yes, because we turned from the, United, from the United States lowercase to the United States yeah. uppercase, right? Prior to the war, David, what, the United States was referred to in the plural, right? And yeah, the United States are, and then yeah. after the United States is. Well, not everybody referred to it that way after the war, of course. Right. Uh, right. Shelby Foote made a big deal of that point in Ken Burns' film series, and we've all come to sort of except everything Selby said is wisdom, <laughs> whether we should or not. But uh, yeah. but a very good point here made that, uh, you know, if you took this, <laughs> if you took this event out of American history, it's hard to imagine what or who we would even be. Right. Uh, I like to think about the Civil War as, well, and it's not just me, this is really a deep theme now and modern scholarship for the past 20 to 30 years, we've really come to see the Civil War as a kind of a destruction of the first American Republic, the death of that first Republic founded in the late 18th century, and the birth of a second. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, uh, it's, it is a kind of second American revolution in the sense that the Constitution gets transformed. Uh, the, the, the deep tragedy, of course, is that any society, any country has to go through this kind of horrifying bloodletting in order to reinvent itself. But that's in effect what we did with the Civil War. We, we reinvented the country through the 13th, the 14th, and 15th uh, amendments to the Constitution, none of which would have occurred, as that question suggests, had it not been for the emancipation of the slaves. Mm -hmm. We have two other comments. Noel, Noel writes, <clears throat> certainly changed the fabric of the culture and our traditions in our Americanness. And Laura notes that all the places you mentioned are places we see as hallowed ground. Let me let me decenter that question a minute. Let me let me let me ask this. We we're, David, you posed that question to uh, history teachers. Uh, we're all history. We've all studied it. Let me ask our teachers. How do your students see the Civil War? Do they see it as the monumental event that uh, we all seem to agree it is, or is it just um, something, you know, lost and, uh, and, and forgotten? Uh, and while, while the teachers are responding to that, David, you could go on uh, and make your sure. continue. Well, I like uh, Noel's point about our Americanness. Now, that's a, that's a vast uh, uh, idea, of course, but uh, the Civil War actually challenged this society, again, horrifyingly, uh, to decide just what it means to be an American. What is an American? Um, an American before the Civil War was, by and large, legally white, 
they might indeed have been an immigrant. Uh, we had no national definition of citizenship. Uh, there, there were even definitions of state citizenship. We had no actual constitutional definition of what it meant to be a U.S. citizen until the 14th Amendment in 1867. Um, and it was only through this um, big war that we expanded that idea, that we at least began to experiment much, much further than the First Republic ever did with expanding uh, this idea of who indeed can be an American. Now, the 14th Amendment says it's anybody born here. The first five words of the 14th Amendment in Clause 1 are uh, the statement, the famous statement of birthright citizenship, which, of course, has been very much back in the news the past year. Uh, but then it goes on to define American citizenship, and it uses that famous, uh, absolutely um, crucial uh, language about how every American citizen shall have equal protection of the law. Now, this notion of equality, that if you're born here, you're a citizen, and you are therefore endowed, to go back to Jefferson's natural rights tradition, but now entitled to, to go to the more modern constitutional definition, you are entitled to certain liberties and rights. It took that civil war, unfortunately, tragically, uh, for us to reach that point in our history of the development of this fledgling idea of human equality. So, so this, this notion about Americanness really was fundamentally transformed out of that war. Of course, the story wasn't over. The story never is over. And the great move ahead that the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments brought were, of course, in so many ways, uh, rejected or betrayed or reversed, or however you want to put it, first by Supreme Court decisions, then by the terrorism of the Ku Klux Klan, then by the counter-revolution in the South, and eventually all but ruined in the Jim Crow system that evolved by the late 19th and early 20th century, necessitating, of course, what in effect became, <laughs> if you like, the birth of our third republic. I mean, one way of thinking about this is that the modern civil rights movement of the 50s and 60s in our own lifetime for many of us, uh, was not only a second reconstruction, as C. Van Woodward once called it, but it really was uh, yet again a transformation, uh, uh, you know, the, the necessity of once again revisiting what does it mean to be an American? Who's an American? Who really has equality? Uh, th th this, is, this is as deep an American story as you could think of. And, of course, it has a great deal to do with why and how the rest of the world stays so interested in us. So I like that point about Americanness. We, we, we forever, aren't we, endlessly debating just what does that mean? Okay, well, then we could move ahead then. Well, hallowed ground is interesting, too. I mean, that's a loaded term, isn't it? It's a fascinating term. Uh, hallowed ground, sacred ground. Uh, it's interesting to stop for a moment, particularly with your, your teenage students, and ask them, so what makes a place sacred? What, what makes a landscape, a place, a piece of real estate sacred, as opposed to a piece of real estate down the road, which isn't. And it's usually, of course, unfortunately, uh, blood sacrifice. Those Civil War battlefields are called hallowed or sacred ground because of the scale of loss, the scale of sacrifice. Uh, uh, on those battlefields, um, and, and, and everybody can come up with their own take of what makes a particular location sacred or, or hallowed. But in this particular case, we have the story, of course, of a war of enormous loss, enormous sacrifice, and in some ways that's where the near obsession we've had over the years with Civil War memory, I think, really begins. Uh, this is this is a, a scale of death and war that uh, Americans have never experienced since, uh, hopefully never will. If you took the number of Civil War dead, which is about 625,000, died of wounds or you know, combat or majority, the big majority, of course, of disease, you took the 625,000 Civil War dead and you moved that per capita to the Vietnam era, 
of the roughly official 12 years of the Vietnam War for the U.S., we would have lost nearly 5 million people in Vietnam. That's almost hard to get your head around. We lost, what, 58 to 60,000. There, there, I think there are 58 plus thousand names on the Vietnam Memorial in Washington. Try to imagine a war where we had to put five million names on it. That's the scale of loss per capita if you go back to the population of 1861 to 1865. That's the kind of impact it had. And just to add to that, one other number, and these kinds of big numbers can affect, I think, students when they hear them. To this day, right now, and I don't remember who did this study off the top of my head, but about one in every three Americans can, this actually surprises me, but apparently it's true, one in every three Americans can trace his ancestry, his or her ancestry, to the Civil War. That is, they can claim an ancestor who lived during or fought in the Civil War. And with all the massive new immigration we've had in the 20th century, uh, from from Europe and now from Asia and from Latin America and on and on and on. It's still one in every three of us had an ancestor that was in this event. Okay. okay. So you want me to move ahead here? Yes. Why don't we move right. on then? Great. Great. Okay. Well, this is the passage that comes right out of my uh, prologue to Race and Reunion. It just sets up the uh, the way, and here you all would know, uh, as great readers of history, I was doing what every historian does. I was trying to boil down <laughs> the infinity of information into three kinds of visions or three kinds of Civil War memory, and we could certainly debate whether these are the only three. But maybe, maybe Richard, you ought to read that quote so we're all, we all have it in our head. Get it on the table. <clears throat> the overall visions of Civil War memory collided and combined over time. One, the reconciliationist vision, which took root in the process of dealing with the dead. Two, the white supremacist vision, which took many forms early, including terror and violence, locked arms with reconciliationists of many kinds, and by the turn of the century delivered the country a segregated memory of the Civil War on Southern terms. And three, the emancipationist vision, embodied in African Americans' complex remembrance of their own freedom, in the politics of radical reconstruction, and in the conceptions of the war as the reinvention of the republic and the liberation of blacks to citizenship and constitutional equality. Yeah, well, these, these are, uh, that's a passage you all did read in the brief prologue in my book. Uh, and here are some ways of thinking about it through these questions. I also use, of course, looking at the second question, this uh, language of healing and justice. I, I find that useful because I think it's what has gone on in all societies that have experienced particularly civil wars like this, you know, where the enemy has to stay when the war is over. Uh, either the victor, the victor or the defeated are not going to leave, by and large. You're all still going to be in the same society, so you face this. And you think of the 20th century, think of modern history, how many societies, even right now, how many societies in the world are facing that very conundrum. How do you achieve both healing, Healing now on the level of, of psychological healing, physical healing, family healing, social healing. But then how do you also achieve public justice? Because what healing, what justice might have meant to white Southerners in Georgia who experienced Sherman's march to the sea and had their land and their possessions destroyed and their slaves liberated and all their property lost, and not only that, perhaps they lost two sons fighting in the Confederate Army, what justice may have felt like to them was an entirely different question, of course, than what justice might have meant to the freed people, to the, to the freed slaves, or for that matter, what justice or healing might have meant to a northern widow who might have lost a husband and a son, and that was not uncommon. It, 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 it gets our minds around just how vexing, how, how terrible a set of dilemmas healing was from this scale of a civil war. It, 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 it ought to help us, it seems to me, understand why uh, 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 reconciling this war was never an easy proposition. Uh, and it was still not an easy proposition at the centennial, and it may not even still be today. But it seems to me the whole point of this is that as a culture, we go to tremendous extents to try to forge reconciliation we, sure, we surely did in America, but sometimes we do that at some costs, huge costs. 
David, if I can just focus on the reconciliationist vision for a moment, because you sure. see there that it took root in the process of dealing with the dead, and that raises one of the questions that came up in the forum. Right. How did the massive number of deaths caused by the war affect American society? Could you could you talk about that for a moment? How did the reconciliationist vision try to encompass and deal with the, 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 the mourning uh, yeah. that was going on? Well, first of all, that's the first huge challenge the whole society faced, of course, north or south, black or white. Uh, the, the scale of death, and, and Drew Faust, uh, the old friend of mine who's now famously president of Harvard, uh, published this recent book just before she became president of Harvard, otherwise we never would have seen it probably, uh, uh, called the, This Republic of Suffering, and we finally do have this major study of, of this phenomenon of death, a death culture that set in with the Civil War. And by that we mean just the sheer logistical challenge of, of finding the dead, burying the dead. But then there was the equal challenge of, of the fact that there were no dog tags and, and the majority of Civil War dead were buried without a name. And then there was the challenge of establishing national cemeteries. And there are over 70 such national cemeteries. That took years to, to do. In the South, it was an even bigger dilemma of locating the dead and bringing them home if possible. Uh, this was a society in colossal collective mourning, and it had to find a way within its Christian, largely cosmology, its Christian worldview, to understand what they had just experienced, to come up with justifications, to come up with some kind of explanation. The spirit of reconciliation is born there uh, in, in this desperate need to understand why, why there are so many dead young men, for that matter older men, all over the country. And eventually what the culture does, it takes, a it takes time, it takes a generation. And my book in the chapters that weren't assigned deals with this at great length. I mean, Eventually, what the culture did more than anything else is it forged a culture of reconciliation largely around not only this scale of sacrifice, which was very mutual, it had happened on both sides, of course, but also around the story of soldiers' valor, the story of soldiers' sacrifice, because that's something both sides experienced on an enormous scale. Again, uh, this is done sometimes out of a natural urge but also sometimes it's done out of, out of uh, a kind of political persuasion, a kind of political impetus. If you really do want a culture of reunion for all sorts of political reasons, to get new investments in the South, to forge industrialization and help it grow, or because you want to give the South back control of its race relations, or an, and if you're in the South, you don't want these black people in legislatures, you don't want them voting, you want them back on farms being good sharecroppers, you begin to remember the Civil War as a story of soldiers' sacrifice and not a war caused by slavery, ending with this mass emancipation of four million slaves and a transformation of the Constitution. In other words, very early, a politics of just what that reconciliationist vision would mean sets in very deeply. And somebody asked here, I noticed, you know, do, do those first two visions ultimately kind of fold into one another? And the answer is, of course, yes. They do indeed. Uh, the white supremacist vision, the reconciliation vision, if we can use these as uh, frameworks in shorthand, did deliver the country an, an essentially segregated, racially segregated memory of this war by, we could say, roughly 1900, certainly by the time of that Blue Gray reunion at Gettysburg on the 50th anniversary in 1913. But boy, we're getting a lot of great questions here. About yeah, if Balkans, I could, about Douglas, about all kinds Right, of if, I, if I could just raise that, bring in the one Julie Joyner asked somewhere back up in the chat. Sure. Um, she asked about the shift in demographics. Oh, I mean, yeah, yeah. Widows after the Civil War oh, yeah. didn't have any influence on the progression of women's rights. And that echoes uh, a question that was raised in the forum yes. about widows and the legal and economic and political power of women. David, could you comment on that? Oh, sure. And the, 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 the widow story here is especially profound in the South. You had whole communities where uh, large percentages of the men had vanished. Uh, and, and, and many white women lived in a, a scale of poverty they had never imagined. And I'm, just talking, I'm not just talking here about planter women, you know, the, 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 the former rich planters, but the vast majority of uh, yeoman women, so-called uh, farm women who had never owned slaves, 
Um, this is obviously a complicated story, an ironic story. Uh, women's suffrage suffers, frankly, no pun intended, uh, as a cause um, because of the Civil War, because of the emergence of black men voting. And that, of course, is the first time in American history that the term male, that gender actually appeared in the U.S. Constitution, was the 15th Amendment, which gave black men the right to vote, but not women. Um, it gave all males the right to vote, um, and but explicitly did therefore not give the right to vote to women. The women's women's rights movement did did get re-spurred, of course, but primarily in the North after the Civil War. And I would urge our teachers. There's a growing literature now on Southern women, Southern white women, by the late 19th and early 20th century, and it's a fascinating, ironic, and complex story. There were many Southern women, for example, who were the daughters of Civil War veterans in particular. Um, they become known as the United Daughters of the Confederacy. That's their name. And by the 1890s, turn of the 20th century, they really are the people in the white South who are controlling the development of, of a culture of memory across the South. They raise the money for monuments and memorials. They have some congressmen wrapped around their fingers. Uh, they even see to the reburial of some Confederate dead and mostly, they developed a kind of a, an argument of the, the loss cause explanation of the war, which within their claim, of course, was that it never had anything to do with slavery, that Robert E. Lee was next to God, and uh, that the South fought nobly for, for, for a great cause. Many of those white Southern women were actually anti-suffrage, not all of them. I mean, there, there are real divisions even among them uh, within these United Daughters of the Confederacy uh, local groups. There would be some women who would support women's suffrage, some who would oppose it and said it was not women's place. It's a very mixed, complicated story. But women got deeply involved, and they did in the North as well, in what could broadly be called memorial culture in a society remembering now where they don't have much in the way of other kinds of political outlets. What I've always found fascinating, and I have a, a long section in Race and Reunion on this, is just how very political some of these Southern white women became in forging the lost cause tradition as a racial ideology at the same time they did not vote. In other words, just because they didn't vote didn't mean they didn't have clout, particularly on a local, on a local level. David, let me let me ask. The, uh, go back to Laura Wakefield's point about the reconciliationist vision combining yeah. with the white supremacist vision. Would you say that culminated in D.W. Griffith's film, The Birth of a Nation, 1915? Oh, no doubt. I mean, yeah. uh, by 1915, Griffith produces this epic, you know, as they always say, uh, the greatest early motion picture in America, rooted in Thomas Dixon's, uh, based on Thomas Dixon's yeah. novel, The Klansman. And yeah, the, that uh, what Birth of a Nation ultimately is, and if you show it to, to high school students, of course, uh, obviously do your homework and prepare them well for it. Because uh, when, when young people first encounter that film, they don't know whether to laugh or cry or walk out of the room. They, they really don't know what to do with it. But what Griffith and Dixon were doing there was capturing what had become virtually a mainstream understanding and explanation of not just the Civil War, but especially Reconstruction. Uh, and its aftermath and the rise of the Ku Klux Klan. It's really the, you know, it's the, it's the Klan epic. It's, it's, it's the ultimate visual of uh, apologia or apology for the Ku Klux Klan. Okay, we have about an hour. Shall we move on? Sure. Oh, okay. You want me to push ahead here? All righty. Uh, well, uh, you read a brief section. Uh, I don't know, it was seven, eight, nine pages. Uh, in the latter part of the book, where I deal at great length with uh, modes or elements of, of black memory, of African-American memory. And I highlight there this encounter uh, between these two great African-American leaders, Alexander Cromwell and Frederick Douglass. They have this encounter uh, in 1885 on Memorial Day in Harper's Ferry at Storer College, a black college founded there right after the war. Up on, if you've ever been to Harper's Ferry, it's 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 right up on the on the hill above town. And today, it's actually the training center of the National Park Service. Beautiful place. At any rate, Crummel gives a commencement speech called "The Need of New Ideas and New Aims for a New Era." Uh, Alexander Crummel, for those who may not know him well, 
uh, was one of the most highly educated African Americans. He had been born in New York. He was educated largely abroad uh, in the antebellum era. In fact, he was educated at Cambridge University in England. Uh, he spent almost 20 years outside of the United States from the late 1850s into the early 1870s. He was not in the country during the Civil War years. He's a theologian. He's a minister. Brilliant man. And he wrote, a, a, oh, dozens and dozens of essays. Many of his sermons have now been published. He had a certain kind of... I hate to use these labels, but he, he, was a, he believed in a certain kind of conservative theology and a certain vision of history. Um, and he, in this speech, makes this direct uh, appeal to, let's face it, it was his black audience, and it was the graduating class of a black college, 1885, 20 years after the Civil War. It's literally the freedom generation he's speaking to. They've all been born probably during the war or even, I guess, right at the end of it. And he appeals to them to not be obsessed with looking backward. Look ahead. Focus on the urgent needs of the present, he says. Don't get paralyzed by that passage, the fantastical anxieties on the subject of slavery. You know, don't look back. Look ahead. Uh, and it's, it's a very common thread in African American thinking and memory in these years, and I, and I and then I juxtaposed it with Douglas in part because Douglas was literally right there in the audience, or probably even on the platform with him, and they were even neighbors in Washington D.C. By the way, uh, and I don't we we don't have any verbatim account of what Douglas actually said that day, except we do have an account that says Douglas got up and vociferously <laughs> disagreed with Cromwell and said, no, we can never forget slavery. We must always look back. We must, before we can move ahead, we must know our history, know our past. Now, what I find so interesting, and I used a bunch of quotes from speeches Douglas had given in those very same years, right around that same time. The whole point of this is obvious, you know, and you could, you could throw this right up in front of your students. Here are two major black leaders of the 1880s. One is saying, stop dwelling on the past, look ahead. The other is saying, well, sure, look ahead, but know your history, know everything about it. You can trace African-American history, as Douglas said, like a wounded man through a crowd by the blood. And the danger is in forgetting. So how much remembering and how much forgetting for a people now whose roots in this country are rooted in slavery and the potential shame that can flow with that? This was a very difficult, vexing kind of issue just 20 years out from the Civil War. And frankly, you know, obviously where this is going, the suggestion is that this became over time a very vexing question for African Americans for the next generation, the next generation, the next generation, and it still is today. How much do a people focus on or dwell upon their slave roots in this country, and how much do they not is at the heart of so much that goes on in what we can broadly here call black memory over time. That encounter between these two giants uh, you know, gave me a way of kind of just laying out this question. Look back, don't look back. How much, how much memory is enough? How much is too much? You know, it's, it's, still, it's still the question we face sometimes almost every day in the classroom. Yeah. yeah. David, if we could just backtrack very briefly for a second. Sure. Laura Wakefield notes that Birth of a Nation was screened at the White House, and then uh, Joe Linda notes that uh, Woodrow Wilson was sympathetic to the Southern View. Wilson was more than sympathetic. Right? Before he was president, he was an historian, and he helped to disseminate that reconciliation, white oh, yeah. supremacist uh, view, right? Well, he did. He, he, he was often uh, uh, kind of... Uh, very general about it, but there's no question. Woodrow Wilson, you know, is born uh, in Virginia. He grows up in Georgia. Uh, he's uh, educated at Princeton, but he's very much Southern. Uh, and and it's not only in his response to the birth of a nation in 1915, but Wilson, as many of you may know, brought a, a whole group of his fellow white Southern so-called progressives, and they were they called themselves that, but they were progressives who believed in segregation, believed in the Jim Crow system they had helped create in the South. He brought that to Washington, and it was the Wilson administration. And uh, when he's, he's elected in the fall of 1912, in that you know that big disputed election, he only got 40 percent of the vote. It's a classic case. Well, like Lincoln, he only got 40 percent of the vote because it was a four-way election. 
But when he's inaugurated in March of, eight, of 1913, uh, his administration, by July, when he goes to Gettysburg to give that speech at that Blue-Gray reunion that we can talk about in a while, um, he he has already put people in place, and they are already resegregating three branches of the federal government, especially the Postal Service and the Treasury Department. So, yeah, and even in his writings, um, and, of course, Wilson was a trained historian. Uh, we haven't had many of those in the presidency. Uh, even in his writings, he had been a, a, a proponent of a kind of a moderate version of the lost cause tradition. We, you can see in Woodrow Wilson the way the lost cause, as a set of arguments, really did become nationalized. David, since we're on the topic here of uh, African Americans, maybe we could take up some of the questions that were raised in the forum. Um, first, sure. uh, quickly, how well were freed African Americans welcomed in the North? I mean, they were they not very much. Uh -huh. uh, indeed, uh, <laughs> as the teachers may know, uh, in the passage of the Fifteenth Amendment, uh, which gets through Congress in 1868, ratified in 69. Uh, that was that was voting rights for black men in the South, not in the North. There were still northern states trying to deny the right to vote to black men, uh, even four years, five years out after the Civil War. Uh, I, you know, this was not a 100% a point of view across the North. Um, but there really wasn't any large-scale migration of black Southerners into the northern states or cities in the immediate wake of the Civil War, uh, by any means, There's, there begins to be a trickle over time. Most of the migration is is within the South. The, the rural to urban migration that we begin to see, indeed, uh, 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 after Reconstruction, in particular, growth of the tenant system and the sharecropping system, that rural to urban migration is mostly to southern cities, which do grow uh, in very sizable uh, dimensions. Uh, whole black communities. And that is where you begin to also, of course, see, uh, even before it's de jure, you begin to see de facto forms of residential segregation, re residential Jim Crow, transportation Jim Crow, and job and economic Jim Crow evolving in the South before you ever really get an actual Jim Crow law passed. Now, that's not to let the North off the hook, of course, either, because Jim Crow had been practiced in different kinds of forms in the North well. Uh, before the Civil War. So, no, no, the, 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 there are no uh, committees welcome, you know, for Southern blacks right. in Cleveland or Cincinnati or, <laughs> you know, Boston and New York forming uh, in the 1870s and 1880s. If anything, there was, in the wake of the Civil War, a degree of, of Northern white fear that part of the chaos that might flow from emancipation would be massive uh, migration of blacks to northern cities. That really doesn't occur until after the turn of the 20th century, the so-called Great Migration um, uh, by uh, the era of World War I. Right. And th that trickle of, of free blacks moving north, did that provoke much job competition, Patrick Jones uh, asks? Uh, yes. Yes, indeed. It did. Uh, uh, indeed. I mean, and and as, as members of this group probably know, in the great colossal collision between capital and labor, you know, when the labor movement gets traction by the 1880s and 90s and turn of the century and, and gets more radical and you see much, many more strikes, uh, trade union strikes, blacks, of course, uh, are hired by companies as strike breakers. Uh, uh, many, many, many instances of that in the North uh, and even in border states, uh, in border state cities where, where uh, for that matter, even in the South, uh, where mill towns really grow, really grow. Uh, in fact, the, the best economic growth in some ways going on in the American South by the 1890s, turn of the 20th century, were these mill towns. Um, uh, although unionism in the South never caught on as much as in the North. There was an earlier question, too, and we ought to maybe take it up right here before we leave this, about just how the, the Civil War itself fueled industrialization or, or didn't, and we've, you know, we've had a long historian's debate over this, as many may know here, going all the way back to Charles Beard and even before, as to just what a marker the Civil War and Reconstruction really are in the history of industrialization. There's no question, it's a huge marker. Um, but we've had, we, it, it always depends on how you study it. If you study this question only through economic models, which is what economists tend to do, 
they will tell you that the war itself didn't ne was not necessarily the launching pad, you know, the engine of the Industrial Revolution. That Industrial Revolution was already happening before the Civil War, and that it, it, you know, it's growing after the war, whether the war had ever happened or not. But, but there is absolutely no question that the war stimulated a degree of manufacturing and a certain kind of manufacturing that nothing else ever could have. In fact, uh, a recent book I would recommend to get a take on this is by Mark Wilson. Of course, I'm blocking the title right now, but it, um, it's all about the mobilization of the federal government. This is the union side, the federal government and its relationship with private enterprise to produce the material of the Civil War. What he did is he went into... This is one of those cases of a massive set of records that, that just had not been adequately studied. He went and studied the records of the Quartermaster's Corps uh, in Washington, D.C., and it turns out that became, other than the Union Army, the largest single employer in the United States by 1865. It had almost 100,000 people. Imagine that. There are not that many companies today that employ 100,000 people. Uh, employed by the federal government, to, to engineer this massive mobilization of the American economy to produce for war. It's, it's the original modern case we have of this relationship of government to private enterprise to produce for a national purpose. And it's also deeply relevant to our ongoing constant debate today over, you know, big government. Where did big government come from? Who's responsible for it? Where did it begin? It began right there. During the Lincoln administration, it was the original Republican Party that founded big government, and it was a massive, colossal, cooperative deal, sometimes with a degree of corruption, but it is amazing how efficient this arrangement was in just three years, really, of putting together this kind of government-private enterprise collaboration to produce for war. And all that came whole companies, of course, textiles, producing shoes and all sorts of and weaponry that survived uh, the war into the latter 19th century. David, um, your, your mention of <clears throat> internal migration within the South raises some other questions that were uh, uh, put forth in the forum about how uh, African Americans were received in southern cities, especially those who uh, brought with them skills, yeah. uh, not, yeah, not yeah, just yeah. farm hands. Right. Could, you, could you address that, Platt? Well, they were welcome, uh, and in some cases welcome also uh, by railroad companies, as railroads really expanded in the South, and we all know that eventually railroad jobs for blacks usually meant porters, uh, but, but actually being a porter on railroads eventually became a pretty good job, and eventually it created the first famous black unions, the, the sleeping car porter union. Um, yeah, their skills were valued uh, in towns and cities, uh, and yet, uh, uh, most black workers who came to a city, say, circa 1880s, 1890s, turn of the 20th century, faced all kinds of job racial discrimination. And make no mistake, uh, you know, the jobs in those mill towns uh, in the South went first to white people. They were good jobs and not to black people. Uh, it was an artisan economy. If a black man with great skills, he came out of slavery with great skills, um, with his hands, with his mind, you know, that kind of intellectual capital, if you want. He could go to a city, but he'd still be basically working on his own as an artisan. Uh, now, 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 in expanding cities, and particularly for carpenters and in construction, these are some cities now that are really, really growing. Cities like Raleigh in North Carolina, uh, modest-sized, well, I think of Columbia, South Carolina, which had to be entirely rebuilt because Sherman's army burned it and destroyed it. Atlanta. Uh, huge swaths of which were destroyed in the war, was being rebuilt by the 80s and 90s. You know, that's where the new South fervor was really growing. So, yeah, a skilled carpenter, if he's black, is going to get some work. Uh, but it didn't mean he was, you know, welcome into the new companies uh, as if there were white people who could take those jobs. Mm -hmm. In fact, we've had a lot of scholarship, of course, on the origins of Jim Crow in the South and its many, many, many forms. It was in this level of economic separation, job separation, where you can actually see by 1900 the Jim Crow system uh, 
uh, just taking shape even before some states had ever passed a single law. Okay, and so you mentioned <clears throat> the uh, uh, African Americans who went to work on the railroads, and there was the emergence of the Brotherhood of Pullman Car Porters. So, in, to address another question in the form, were these skilled workers a base for African American leadership? The answer to that, in a word, would be yes, right? Oh, sure. Oh, sure. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Well, and but the other big base, of course, were ministers in the church. Uh -huh. But yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, we've got about 40 minutes, so if we could uh, move okay. ahead then. All right. Oh, and through the wonders of the internet, Laura Wakefield found the title of Mark Wilson's book. Oh, there it this is. This is yeah. Civil Thank War, you. Military this Mobilization of the State, 1861-65. So there you have it. Thank you, Laura. Hey. Okay. Thank you. That's, that's a, the book's got a lot of graphs and charts and tables, but, <laughs> but it's really valuable. And you could, you could pull some things from it just to show students if they want to understand, you know, the origins of big government and the role of the government in the economy, especially in wartime. That's where it started. Well, here you have this famous photo, which you probably have seen before. Uh, Ken Burns used actually some footage like this in his film series in 1990. Uh, it's a scene from the 1913 Blue-Gray reunion at Gettysburg. I might just give a brief little background on that. There have been many other Blue-Gray reunions by this point in time. This is the 50th anniversary. Uh, they started having these Blue-Gray affairs largely in the 1880s. They weren't easy to do at first <laughs> because the soldiers didn't want to come, particularly Confederates. Uh, never wanted to come to Gettysburg. That was the scene of their greatest defeat, you know. But they do start coming in groups in the 80s and into the 90s. By the middle of the 1890s, cities were competing all over the country, including the South, for these big blue-gray reunions. The the um, United Confederate Veterans, the Southern Veteran Organization, and the GAR, the Grand Army of the Republic, organized these things. They, they, organized, they, they rented entire trains that would take men. Atlanta, for example, held uh, the, the great national blue-gray reunion in 1900. Uh, Louisville, other southern cities, uh, even in Florida. They had one of these big things in Florida. But by 1913, 50th anniversary at Gettysburg, they held this extraordinary event. It was planned for years by the state of Pennsylvania and by the War Department. The federal government paid for most of this, although some of the states paid as well. If you were a Civil War veteran living anywhere in the United States and you were on anybody's mailing list, you were, were given the right to come to this reunion and they paid your train fare. And veterans came from both sides, from every state in the Union, including every Western state, except, I believe, two. It was like Nevada and Wyoming, I think, were, then, were in the Union by then, but the, they didn't send any veterans. But, but veterans came, you know, there were Confederates living in Oregon, there were Union veterans living in Los Angeles, there were, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They came from all over the country, thousands of miles for this four-day festival. But it was planned from its inception, and there are great records on this, and there's a big commemorative book that was produced right at the end of it. It was planned from its inception as a festival of reconciliation, a festival of reunion, a festival of harmony. It was, in fact, it was called the Great Peace Jubilee. And I write about it in Race and Reunion, but I think, unfortunately, in uh, Chapter 1 and, and then the final epilogue, where you haven't probably read it yet, but maybe you could at some point, uh, it was an amazing event. And it was covered by the press all over the country, dozens of photographers, and they produced lots of these kinds of photographs. These are Union and Confederate veterans, obviously, actually shaking hands across a stone wall. If you've been to Gettysburg, it's right there along the high water mark. Uh, this is all, of course, very staged, uh, but these kinds of things were, were staged all over the battlefield during these four days. The veterans all lived in a huge, gigantic tent city. But the important thing to understand about this is that there were no black veterans at this reunion. They were not allowed at this reunion. This was a Jim Crow reunion. The only black people at this huge event, about 50 5,000 veterans came to this. The only black people at this were the black men who built the latrines for the tent city, uh, 
worked in the mess tents, handed out blankets. And in other words, they were part of the staff, but no black veterans were allowed. Every governor of every state came to this, many of whom were still Civil War veterans. In fact, uh, 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 what's his name? William, uh, his name was uh, Mann, William Hodges Mann, M-A-N-N, -N. The, the governor of Virginia was himself a Confederate veteran. And the governor of Pennsylvania at that point was himself a Union veteran. The average age of one of these veterans at that reunion was about 74 years old. I mean, some of them were much older in their 80s, uh, and some a bit younger, uh, who had been just boys uh, during the war. Um, but here you have it, this photogenic, this richly symbolic image of a country put back together, uh, a, you know, a reunion reforged among them, the men who'd actually fought the battle. And, and as you may know, they actually tried to stage, they did stage some sort of little mini reenactment with these old guys moving up Cemetery Ridge toward the wall, uh, and and there were actually even uh, voice recordings of some of them done at, at that time. And as you know, a film, moving film, had been invented by then, and there's footage of this. But again, the, the key point here is that there were no speeches allowed at this reunion. There was speech after speech after speech. They built a huge tent right out by what's called the high water mark. And they, I forget, about 15 or 20,000 of the veterans fit inside that tent. Um, and they held a big event on the final day, the 4th of July. And the keynote speaker was, of course, Woodrow Wilson, President of the United States, just been inaugurated that spring. And as I say in my book, Wilson did not want to go to this. Uh, he's the first Southern born president elected since the Civil War. And no one is more aware of that than Woodrow Wilson. He wanted nothing to do with this Bull Gray reunion. He didn't want to go there. And he, and he had turned down the invitation repeatedly until one of his aides walked into him about four days before this reunion and said, Mr. President, you have to go. It's just an amazing event that's happening there. Fifty-some thousand veterans. It's covered by all the national press. It's even covered by the British press, Mr. President. You have to write a speech and show up. And he did. He, they whisked him into town by train. They put him in the back of a convertible. He was driven out to the high water mark. He walked into the tent, uh, bordered on one side by the governor of Pennsylvania and on the other side by the governor of Virginia, by a Union veteran and a Confederate veteran, each holding their respective flags. And there were a lot of stars and bars and Confederate flags waving all over this place that day. Wilson went into the big tent and gave his own sort of Gettysburg address, which is, of course, why many presidents don't like to go to Gettysburg, because I always get compared, compared to that guy from 1863. But in this speech that Wilson gives, he captured this spirit of reconciliation. He says things like, we are not here to talk about the causes and consequences of the war. We are here to let the veterans look into each other's eyes, shake each other's hands, embrace again as brothers, and and, you know, and it's a beautiful sentiment. Who, who could be against that? And in the end of his speech, Wilson calls the Civil War, uh, quote, the quarrel forgotten. The quarrel forgotten. It's over. The war's over. It's all gone. We've, we've all reconciled. But, of course, this moment in American history is, you know, outside of this reunion is, is Jim Crow America. It's the American apartheid that's been put rigidly in place. And the issues over which this war had been fought uh, and the great consequences of this war, whether they're all about race or not, just consider Reconstruction itself, never got discussed in this four-day affair, in speech after speech after speech. And that was all by design. The whole point here is to show that memory is uh, the national or the collective, the public memory of any nation's great events so often depends on who's forging that memory, to what ends, under what kinds of power, what kinds of control. And this may have been the most highly orchestrated, certainly most visual, uh, in scale the biggest, such Civil War memory moment perhaps the country ever had. They did another big blue-gray reunion at Gettysburg on the 75th anniversary in 1938. Of course, by then, there aren't 
that many veterans left. They're really, really dying off. And by the way, I should tell you, if you look at the final segment of Ken Burns' film series, which surely some of you have even taught, perhaps, and watch that final episode again, because Ken uses a lot of footage of this, and why not? As a filmmaker, it's great stuff. I don't blame him for a moment. But he, he, did, he did some interesting trickery there. You will see at the very end of that film, just before Shelby Foote comes on, you know, to tell us another wonderful piece of wisdom, you see an old black veteran and an old white veteran shaking hands. Both of them have medals, and they even look into the camera. I mean, it's unforgettable. It's just a gorgeous moment. The problem is he portrays that as though it's 1913. That particular footage of the black and the white veteran were 25 years later. In 1938, during the New Deal, when FDR went to Gettysburg to create that so-called Peace Light Memorial, um, Burns actually folded, <laughs> by film editing, a black veteran into the story he was telling of 1913 uh, without telling it. There were no black veterans there. So we would say that the uh, Blue Gray Union in 1913, if we were talking about that today, we would call that a media event. Oh God, yes. It was yeah. it was yeah. front page, and you know, if you, if you go back through microfilm or whatever and look up newspapers in the United States for July one to four or five, nineteen thirteen, it's on page one of almost every newspaper. Right. Right. Partly because this was so photogenic. I mean, look at that. I mean, yeah. and in that image, you can tell many many stories. And and what's more beautiful than a bunch of old men with medals? You know. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, before we move on, we've got about 30 minutes left. Before we move on, let me just pose a question that Laura asked. Do you remember where the reunion was in Florida? Uh, gosh, great question. I think it was Jacksonville. Yes, yeah, I bet it was. I'd have to go back yeah. and look. Uh, yeah. Jacksonville in those years even had a kind of a mini World's Fair. Uh -huh. Actually, that was back in the late 1880s. Yeah. But Jacksonville was one of those those you know big growing cities at that time. I think Jacksonville had a blue gray. I don't think they would have gone all the way to Miami, for example. No, that, that, that yeah, Laura says it makes sense it would have been in, in Jacksonville. Well, we could move on then. And the one before we do the one comment I, that always struck me about that picture: none of those guys are smiling. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, and that may in part be because it is so staged, as you suggested. <laughs> on the other hand. You know, give them their due. Uh, these yeah. guys, average age 74, some of those guys are probably 80 years old. Yeah. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, these guys they assembled for that photo uh, were actual survivors of July 3 of that day in yeah. Uh, 1863. So that you talk about sacred ground or hallowed ground, and it's entirely possible that some of these uh, Confederate veterans had never been there. It may have been their first time ever there. And also you need to remember, I mean, look at those Confederate veterans. They've been given special new coats for this, man. They have been, and look at those hats. They have been especially dressed up for this event. Yeah. And the, many of these old guys, you know, had, may have even been suffering in hospitals by this point in time. And for someone to give them this much attention, uh, would have been something very special. So a certain somberness on their faces is not that surprising. And by the way, in the uh, records of this reunion, uh, it, the, the, the way the War Department and the government portrayed it was, was fascinating. They portrayed it as a great triumph of efficiency that, that the government could pull off an event like this. You know, 55,000 men living in tents and so on and so on. Uh, you know, a huge logistical public uh, proposition. They were very proud of the fact that only 11 of the old veterans died during the reunion, and they claimed that was four four times less than the national average for that age group. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Weird sort of statistic. But those yeah. years, as many of the teachers know, was a period of all this intense interest in industrial efficiency, and in some ways that reunion was a was a was a kind of act of industrial efficiency. So yeah, we've got about ahead? 25 minutes. Yes, right. move ahead. Oh, that's just another yeah. uh, close-up version. Blow-up of the image, yeah. Yeah, that's a okay. great blow-up. Okay. There we go. All right, now you're on Monument Avenue. Some of our teachers have no doubt been to Richmond. Uh, Monument Avenue began in 1890 with the unveiling of the great Lee Equestrian, and then it developed over really about the next 15 years with statues of Jeb Stewart, Stonewall Jackson, 
uh, Jefferson Davis, uh, Maori, the uh, head of the Confederate Navy. There are five major Confederate monuments. Uh, each of them is about a half mile apart up this avenue. It's a beautiful uh, avenue, uh, um, as many would know if they'd been there. And it was really designed as a kind of expansion, and a kind of almost suburb of Richmond. And to this day, it, you know, it's lined with these beautiful brownstones and so on. But this was the original monument, this huge Lee Equestrian, unveiled in 1890. It was a big, big, big event, a parade of thousands of people. Some controversy, too, uh, uh, particularly in the northern press, about uh, it's not the first memorialization of Lee in the South, but it had never been done on this scale. I mean, there was already a, a, a standing statue of Stonewall Jackson, for example, unveiled in Richmond as early as 1875. Uh, and there were a couple other renderings of Lee around the South already, but my God, the scale of this. This thing is like almost 60 feet high, um, a huge event. And in the North, and, and by the way, lots of Confederate flags used at the unveiling. And there were... Members of the Northern Press, as I point out here, just one example from the Minneapolis Tribune, that wondered, why has this Lee cult caught on so deeply? What's this all about? Why is Lee becoming this national hero, the leader of the side that lost, that was defeated, uh, that by by any legal definition for many people, you know, had had committed treason? Uh, but it, it's it's a it's a very poignant visual uh, representation of how the lost cause had become or was becoming by 1890 and certainly through the next decade or two a part of the national culture. And it's all, and it leads to this question of, you know, why is it in America uh, that the side that was defeated so decisively in this massive civil war, nevertheless on our landscape, gets commemorated so beautifully, so openly, so vividly. People from abroad, I've been asked this many times, you know, if you urge them to go to Monument Avenue or you just urge them, you know, to go around the South and see all the Confederate monuments, they, they wonder, uh, how can that be? <laughs> the side that lost. This guy, Lee, led the uh, Confederacy. How can he be memorialized so openly? And of course, some answers to that are obvious. Uh, 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 once the southern states were back in the Union, uh, once the southern state governments were back under the control of the Democratic, you know, the white Democratic Party, uh, uh, southerners were free to represent their story as they wished. Uh, no one had the legal right to prevent them from putting up these monuments if they could afford it. If, if, and indeed, often um, um, a lot of northerners uh, even supported this kind of thing and sometimes contributed money. Now, you know, I, so the question that I put to you and that you might even think about finding a way to put to your own students is why are the leaders of the Confederacy, why is the Confederate story so openly, so vastly memorialized and commemorated on our national landscape? How do we end up explaining that? Well, Jen <clears throat> Baker notes that it's a great question. It would make a great uh, document-based question for her students. But uh, while we're moving ahead here, we have about 20 minutes left. If, if the, our participants have any insights uh, into that, if they'd like to suggest any answers, please uh, chat them in. I was uh, following along these same lines, David. I was recently in uh, Biloxi, Mississippi, and I was at the uh, Jefferson right. Davis house. Right. And uh, his presidential library is being built behind the house. And, uh, well, they have to rebuild it because of Katrina, right? Katrina blew it away, right. Yeah. And part of the funding <clears throat> to rebuild the presidential library is coming from FEMA, the federal government. Uh, oh, yeah. Well, I, I think Haley Barber had a lot to do with pulling that off. Uh, <laughs> and why not? I mean, that's a, that's a, that's a, a, particularly the library. I mean, there's, there should be a Jefferson Davis library if indeed there are papers and materials. Right. Uh, and, you know, it's the kind of problem Richmond faces all the time, obviously, because it was the capital. And I've done a lot of work in Richmond, not just research, but I'm on the board there of the new museum in Richmond that some of the teachers may know uh, called the National Civil War Center at Tredegar. Uh, it's built in part of the ruins or out of part of the ruins of the old Tredegar Ironworks. Uh, 
And Richmond, of course, <laughs> part of its story is the Confederate story, but of course, part of its story is the African American story as well. And part of its story is the fall of Richmond. Uh, and part of its story is Lincoln's coming to Richmond at the end of the war. So you know, it's a it's a complicated, ironic, often messy affair for a city like Richmond. Um, but here I see somebody's asking um, about uh, Nathan Bedford Forrest. Uh, uh, in Memphis, they have a whole park uh, named for Nathan Bedford Forrest, indeed with a large equestrian statue of Forrest in Memphis. And that's, as you may know, been a big controversy in Memphis. There was a group in Memphis that wanted to move the Forrest statue from this very prominent public place right down by the Mississippi River. And there were others who said, no, you shouldn't move that monument. It was put there for a reason. And a person like Forrest, of course, is has both a heroic legacy but also a notorious legacy because he was indeed one of the founders of the Ku Klux Klan. And that gets you into a different territory, doesn't it? You see, Lee, by 1890, and, and then by the turn of the 20th century, Lee had been portrayed as this great Christian soldier, noble American, fought for his state, fought for his homeland, his home, his people. You know, he went with his people. And he was a great military leader, of course. He was a great general. And he he um, stimulated a, a deep and abiding love of his troops. So there is there is that kind of story, not just in Confederate lore, but it even became a sort of a part of the national lore uh, of the Civil War. But nevertheless, he still, you know, <laughs> he was a military leader of what in modern times we've come to call insurgencies, you know, in civil wars. Most civil wars, if you look through modern, strewn throughout modern history, there's dozens and dozens and dozens of civil wars, they usually end. I mean, if one side is, is thoroughly defeated, they usually end with the leadership of that side either arrested and tried and often executed or banished, right, exiled. Now, that did not happen in the United States, and we need explanations of that. Many Confederates did go into exile initially, uh, an estimated 6,000 did, but many of them came back, too. As they went to Canada, they went to Mexico, they went to Brazil, they went to England, uh, particularly high-ranking generals. Lee didn't. Lee stayed uh, and famously became a college president of Washington and Lee. Um, and eventually, Lee has many northern proponents. Uh, Charles Francis Adams, Jr., the famous Adams family became a great, great admirer of Lee and took a speech with him all over the South honoring Lee in about 1900. Of course, Southerners loved it. He was helping make Lee into this kind of national hero, as Charles Francis Adams put it, second only to Abraham Lincoln. Now, if you want national reconciliation out of a civil war, you know, you, you, you make Lincoln into a demigod, and you also make the military commander of the side that lost into a demigod, and you try to find a way to forget Ulysses Grant. <laughs> okay, we got about 15 minutes, so okay. I think we need to move ahead. <clears throat> sure, all right, moving it ahead. There's some great questions appearing here. Well, here's here's old Mr. Page here. Uh, I, there you got a passage from me from the book. I, I highlight Page here largely because he's the prototype, or he's the best representative we had of this kind of popular literature. And you cannot underestimate how widespread and popular the old darky stories, the Negro dialect stories, the loyal slave tales became. Page was only one writer of these kinds of tales. There were many, many others. But he was the biggest seller. In fact, uh, there's a debate over this. But around 1890 or into the early 1890s, Thomas Nelson Page, along with a couple others, briefly Mark Twain, uh, was the largest selling author in the United States. He wrote story after, these were all short stories, Mars Chan, Milady, Mistis, Uncle Billy, da 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 They all basically are the same kind of story. They're stories of loyal, obsequious, often funny, and deeply humane in their own way, slaves. The stories always are pre-war. They're always about that kind of romantic, uh, deeply paternalistic, deeply humane relationship. Yeah, there you go. There's a drawing um, of, of masters and slaves. And here you have an actual passage 
from one of his most famous tales called Mars Chan. Uh, I won't read it in the dialogue. You can read it for yourselves. Uh, it, this is the sort of language he puts in the voice of these loyal slaves. And there you see in this particular, and, and he's, in these, his collections, his books, of course, were illustrated, beautifully illustrated. This is, by the way, a color illustration in the original. And here you see this great plant, the plantation house. There's the master on the on the portico, and and new, the new baby is, of course, the master's son, and he is delivering. He, he's letting this black child hold the baby who will now become, in time, his new master, and the. The blacks are all gathered to honor the baby in, in pure kind of almost monarchical loyalty. Um, and you can see the quote at the bottom. Now, Sam, from this time you belong to your Mars Chan. Um, now, th this kind of wonderful, pastoral, romantic environment is the sort of story that not only Thomas Nelson Pedro, but many others. I argue in Race and Reunion, therefore, and, you know, I mean, this is a, a bit speculative, but I argue that because of the readership, the hundreds of thousands of readers that Page achieved were by far a majority northern whites. The publishing industries in the north, his publishers were in New York, and by the way, Page did these speaking tours all over the north. He went, he did the Chautauqua circuit all across the north. He would speak to hundreds and hundreds of people, and he would read these dialect stories. He was apparently very good at it. He would read these dialect stories to, to crowds in Cleveland, Detroit, Chicago, and they loved it. They loved hearing these darky tales by the 1890s. The readership is majority northern. And so I argued in Race and Reunion that the voice in some ways in the ear of so many white Americans by the 1890s and turn of the 20th century, the voice of the reunion, the voice of all this reconciliation of North and South in the popular literature, the popular culture, became the voice of one of these old darkies, old loyal slaves telling how wonderful it was in the old days on the plantation. And gee whiz, gosh, it's just a shame that, you know, that war came and ended, ended all the good times back on the old plantation. And if you take that kind of popular culture and you dig your nose into it long enough and you read enough of these stories, if you can stand it, you begin to see where Gone with the Wind came from. You begin to see where the Shirley Temple stories are all rooted. And you can begin to see that this kind of loyal slave popular culture did not die in the 20th century and is still there in Hollywood and in popular fiction and so on well into the middle of the 20th century. And it's it, arguably one of the deepest popular legacies, if you want, of the Civil War in the white imagination. Uh, One thing that strikes me about that picture, David, there, there is no young black male in that no. picture. The two, the one man is obviously old and then the other guy doesn't look real young, but there's no young, the children and women and old men, no. there's no young black male in that. That's interesting. That, that's problematic. Good that's a good yeah. point. Yeah, that's a very good point. But the, but the children are just utterly fascinated with, with the baby, of course. And they're all, and, and it's a, I mean, this is, this is almost an image you could take back to, to paintings of monarchs, you know, with their subjects. <laughs> Uh, o over the centuries uh, in, in European painting. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we un I guess the point is we underestimate this kind of popular cultural memory at our risk because thousands upon thousands of people are digesting and consuming this, this sort of material. Well, a lot of great questions coming up here about Uncle Tom's Cabin. And, of course, this is the era where Uncle Tom's Cabin is, is massively popular, particularly as a stage play. Uh, by the 1890s, turn of the century, Uncle Tom, you know, has been sort of transformed from the way Harry Beecher Stowe created the story into, uh, into these Tom shows and Tom plays, which were... And, by the way, minstrelsy, blackface minstrelsy, was the most popular form of American entertainment by 1900. Uh, and you have to kind of see this stuff uh, in that context as well. Mm -hmm. I think we need to move on, Dave. We've got about okay. 10 minutes. All right. All right. And now.
stark contrast to say the least. I don't know how many of you from Florida have been to Boston to see this extraordinary monument, which is on Boston Common. It's right across the street from the Massachusetts State Capitol. It's Augustus St. Gordon's masterpiece of public art. That, that This is the Shaw Memorial. It represents uh, the march of the 54th Massachusetts, the famous black regiment, made even more famous by the movie Glory back in, I think, was it 1989, 1990? Uh, it, is, it is first and foremost a magnificent work of sculpture. Uh, it, it has the faces, if you, if you were up close enough to it, it has the faces of 22 black men in it. They are three deep and in a couple cases, four deep. The entire bas relief is only about a foot and a half deep, about two feet if you count the horse. That's Shaw, of course, on horseback. And behind him, the marching men of the 54th Massachusetts. It's located right on Boston Common, right where this regiment marched off to war um, in late May 1863 uh, in front of a huge crowd. And the faces the St. Gaudens caught on this monument are both young and old. You've got a drummer boy out front who may have only been, you know, 14, 12 years old. You've got older men and young men. This was the consummate kind of national black regiment, even though it was recruited in Massachusetts. These men were recruited from all over the country. Some of them were former slaves. The majority of them were born free. They came from almost every northern state. The largest group actually came from Pennsylvania. They were a kind of national black regiment. What I liked, and I take teacher groups there every summer, and I've often taken students there as well. What I like to point out about this monument is that it, again, it's a, it's a magnificent work of art in the sense that through bronze it tells a story. Note the arc of the legs, the grace of those men. They're, they're moving forward, forward, forward. And, of course, if you know the story of the 54th Mass, those men are, by and large, marching to their deaths. They had 60% casualties at Fort Wagner in, in the third week of July, uh, their major battle uh, down around uh, on Charleston Harbor on what was then called Sullivan's Island. Um, most of these men are marching to their deaths, and it's that story in the midst of the Civil War that black men had to not only don a uniform, put a musket on the shoulder, but they actually had to go bleed and die before most Americans would actually acknowledge them as men, as human beings. And of course, in the broader sense, what this monument represents is, uh, again, through the, the power of art, is the story of emancipation. It's the story of a war that ultimately, by 63-64, was being fought uh, to end slavery, uh, to destroy this system. And if you juxtapose this <laughs> up against, uh, say, Thomas Nelson Page's images of the old plantation darkies, you begin to see how starkly different stories and versions and narratives about the Civil War were becoming by the 1890s. This was unveiled in Boston in 1897 on Memorial Day, and the two keynote speakers were Booker T. Washington and William James. James, the famous Harvard philosopher. And there's a line in James's speech. They both gave fascinating speeches, but there's a line in James's speech where he says, you can almost hear and feel the bronze Negroes breathe, which was in some ways his tribute to St. Gaudens, that he had captured them so powerfully uh, in you know, a monument of bronze. But here you have, if you want, the emancipationist memory of the Civil War. In the previous image from Page, you have the white supremacist memory of the Civil War. And then earlier, you know, in that Blue Gray reunion photo, you have the classic reconciliationist vision of the war. And you can see them clashing. You can see how they overlapped but didn't overlap. And that's been our problem with Civil War memory, is how do we put all these things into, you know, narrative? How do we put all these visions? one story? Can we put them all into one story? Can we tell all these stories at once and get away with it? Do we want to hear all these stories at once? 
anyway, great questions again here are emerging. Um, I just wish we had time to take them all up. Somebody here, oh, Samantha, says you had a student. Um, and yeah, <laughs> they thought the 54th wasn't very good because they uh, they uh, suffered so many casualties. I know, and they had one Medal of Honor winner. Yeah, oh. God. Yeah. Well, I don't know where they're learning their military history, but uh, the reason they had so many casualties is they were thrown in first in, to attack a huge fort that they had no chance of ever taking. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the story is is true. You know, Shaw volunteered them to go first. Mm -hmm. Well, we end here with a slide I think that our teachers could use in class, and it might be worthwhile just to spend a, 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 our last few minutes here comparing these two. Yeah. Um, one obviously is the you know exalting the great man, and one the other one there has a great man in it in the equestrian yeah. tradition, but also it's a tribute to uh, a corporate effort, uh, his company. And um, well put, yeah, yeah, very really well put. Yeah. And I like I like the, the position of the horse's head too. I mean, it, oh, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, one is up going forward, the other one bowed, kind of tranquil, um, yeah. almost in you know marching off into retirement. Uh, indeed, indeed, and uh, and you know again with enough uh, even a little background on Lee and then on Shaw. I mean Shaw is the son of abolitionist in Boston. Uh, he he's only 27 years old when he died at Fort Wagner. He wasn't even sure he wanted to command this regiment. Uh, his father and the governor of Massachusetts, Governor Andrew, basically appointed him to him to command this regiment. He didn't. He didn't really have any choice. Um, and that that monument again represents the actual march of that regiment down the street that day. And they marched right by the house Shaw grew up in. He stopped in front of his parents' house, and on the balcony of that house that day was none other. Then Frederick Douglass, William Lloyd Garrison, a whole host of other Boston area abolitionists, his parents, the governor of Massachusetts, and we are told that they brought out a bust of John Brown and put it out on the balcony, and that while the margin, while the regiment marched by, and Douglass, of course, had his two sons, his son Lewis and his son Charles were in that regiment. Douglas, we are told, put his hand on the top of the head of the bust of John Brown as the troops went by and saluted. It's also true that Douglas then got into a carriage and went out to the harbor and went on the ship with the troops, with his two sons, out to the last point in Boston Harbor that, that he could stay with the boat. And then he was put into a rowboat and brought ashore. It was as though he had recruited his two sons into this regiment, but he was going to go hug him and hold on to him as long as he could. Sure, sure. Yeah. And Lee, by the way, uh, if you've ever read Douglas Southall Freeman, the great biographer of Lee, who had probably more to do with anybody in making Lee into a demigod, wrote a three-volume biography of Lee back in the 1930s, 40s, 50s. Freeman lived right there off Monument Avenue and walked to work every day. He was a journalist. He wrote for the uh, Richmond Examiner. And he walked right by the statue every day, and we're told that Freeman stopped and saluted every day on the way to work because he uh, went to work to write his biography of Lee. And to this day, there are plenty of people around who still see Robert E. Lee as you know, one of the three or four greatest of Americans. Uh, that's something that you know we will forever continue to debate. Mm -hmm. Was there any uh, comparison of Lee to Washington? And you know, Lee went off after the war, and he became oh, yeah. the president of uh, what is now Washington and Lee. Uh, and he, and he, he didn't go back <clears throat> into government service. Washington wanted to retire to his farm and, and yeah. walk away from federal government service, but of course he was brought back as the president. Any mm -hmm. parallels between the two of them drawn at the time? Uh, oh, sure. In, in Confederate memory, that's drawn all the time. Yeah. Uh, that Lee is the embodiment of George Washington and so on and so forth. Lee, of course, had no great farm or plantation to go back to. Uh, he, he ended up having a house in Richmond, but his great estate there uh, in Arlington uh, was, of course, appropriated by the federal government, by the Union Army, and it was Lee's estate there, which he actually inherited, of course, from his wife, who was uh, a direct Washington descendant, uh, 
uh, Lee married into the George Washington clan, the George Washington That's right. extended family. And Arlington, of course, was appropriated as the first great national Civil War cemetery. Mm -hmm. Lee's own property mm -hmm. was made into a union, the biggest of all American cemeteries, which is, mm -hmm. of course, one of the deep, deep ironies of the Civil War. Right. Well, ending this seminar talking about a cemetery seems appropriate. Let me uh, ask our participants, are there any um, final questions before we wrap things up? Any, any points we left uncovered that we can, we can raise? Okay, all right. Well, we, we don't seem to have any. Let me remind you that the uh, form that you use to begin the seminar will still, we maintain that until July 1st. We'll take a look at your questions and comments and uh, respond to you. I want to thank uh, David for giving us an excellent seminar, and I want My to thank pleasure. all of you for your uh, intelligent and enthusiastic participation. This is our last seminar for uh, this year. Uh, we'll begin again in the fall. Laura will give you the dates on that. I uh, hope you all have a good summer. Thank you, and good morning. Good luck to you all. Take care.